Ladies and gentlemen, we must train our presidents. Because the history of our presidents has been that we have had wild presidents. And we must tame, if we don't tame the president, we are going to come back to this problem. And I said we must entrench Article 102. Two. I was almost killed in parliament. I was almost lynched in parliament. Um, and some of the lynchers have left. They're not here anymore, but they're now in the other side. I said we must entrench 102 because Uganda's problem has been the problem of imperial presidents. And it continues to be the problem of imperial presidents. And until we tame that problem, howsoever, howsoever, we embellish our constitutions, ladies and gentlemen, we're going nowhere on the path to constitutionalism. And so for me, the first lesson that I want us to think about is that we can't wait, number one, for the state to bring, for those of you who believe in heaven, to bring manna to our tables. We must design our own. We must force this process ourselves. We must take it over. We must re-invoke i always used to say we went from fundamental change to no change we need to go back to fundamental change not of the bush side but in order to reform our constitution we need to evoke people's power not just in parliament but outside of parliament in order to go back to respect for that constitution that's point number one so don't forget our history because our history has that lesson we made a mistake. This time, we can't make the same mistake. We can't wait. The second point is that the Kenyan experience tells us, because as you know, who, 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 who drafted the Kenyan constitution? It wasn't the Constitutional Commission. The very first draft of the Kenyan constitution came from an organization called the, the, the I think it was the K, four, four Cs. I grow old, but I saw the first draft of that constitution in 1992 from people like Kibuda Kibwana, Willy Mutunga, Makao Mutua, the Kenyan Human Rights Commission, and so on. It was driven from below. And the people from below struggled with those from above. Moi was resisting. And that resistance was eventually overcome to produce the constitutional of Kenya that you have. It took 20 years because of that struggle. It took 20 years. And so the lesson is that one, we can't wait, but two, it has to be a collective struggle by you, members of parliament, by us outside of parliament, and we must push this process. And again, you know, people lament, they say, oh, you're few and so on and so forth. But we all know the old story, Chinua Achebe said it best. Anybody who despises small things has never spent a night with a mosquito. No, you, you all know how powerful a mosquito is. a small thing. You spend a night with a mosquito, it will keep you awake. It may even give you malaria. The opposition has to become the mosquito. The opposition has to keep the government on its toes if we're going to produce constitutional change, which is sustainable. And that's why my second point, and uh, I think both Karoli, Professor Sempeba, and some of the others said, the Kenyan constitution is very elaborate, but so was the Ugandan constitution. If you compare the 1967 constitution and the 95 constitution, it's almost doubled in size. We put everything in there. Everything plus the kitchen sink. Because we said we can't trust these politicians. We must do what? Put these things in there so that we hold them. What happened? What happened? Hmm? What happened? And we must ask ourselves again, why 
did that happen in order to, pre to pre prevent it? And this leads me to the point of words. The Kenyan constitution is powerful, but it's much less because of the words which they use than the spirit behind those who use the words. Let's take a word like accountability that my brother Witi has talked about in terms of the legislative accountability, the same that we have here. The same that we have here, but are we using those words in an effective way? Are we pushing for accountability in terms of those who use our finances, those who use our weapons, those who use our resources? Are we, as members of parliament, enforcing that accountability? Because the accountability is there. It's in the constitution. You have the word, you have the power. It just depends on how long, how far, how wide you stretch it. Right? A word, a word in the hands of a wordsmith can be a dictionary. So it is up to you politicians to say, if this is accountability, this is what we mean by accountability. And do not allow the executive to dictate accountability. So for me, the 95 constitution, in fact, has all the elements there <coughs> for us to impose that accountability. Let's take the question of vetting. Let's take the question of vetting. How many, how many unqualified, unfit, incompetent, corrupt individuals do we allow to pass through the parliamentary appointments process? How many? Should I count them? Hmm? Where well, we know them. Why? And you have the power to amend your rules of procedure so that the vetting process is made a public process like it is in Kenya. So that we know that if Oloko Nyango has been nominated for what position would you want me to take? Ah! You can ask, but Oloka, in your village in Kiei there, didn't you steal somebody's vote? And can you please tell us, how come you're so rich and powerful, but we have never seen your taxes? These are questions that you must be asking as parliament. How come we have all these people who came from the bush without a cent and now they're dollar millionaires? Where did they get that money? From who did they get that money? Show us your taxes. So these processes, we can translate and transform. Somebody talked about the elephants in the room. The other difference, of course, that we have, or that the problem that we have is militarization. Militarization. And the militarization, I'm afraid, um, I, I, I don't know whether it will be reversible, but where we have reached with the militarization, if we don't do something about it, we are all going to become privates in a personal army. So we have to deal with this elephant. The process of the militarization of all these institutions and instruments and facilities of government, of the state, if we don't, we're going to be in a problem. Especially because we are mortal. And that is the problem. We make our constitutions for individuals. So in 62, we made our constitution for the individuals at the time. In 66, we did the same. In 95, we made the Museveni constitution. Now we're going into 30 years of that constitution and Mr. Museveni, as you can see, he's uh, in his declining years. He's going to terminate, like all of us. Now the key question will be, will he die with this constitution and then we get Huga's constitution or Chagulani's constitution 
or a Kenner's constitution or in Bitte's constitution? Is that what we are looking to? Because these are finite individuals, but our institutions are timeless. So unless we deal with these legacies, the legacy of militarism, of militarization, the continuous militarization that we are undergoing, we shall have no, no democracy. And constitutional reform would be meaningless. Um, I made a joke. I said, you know, if we cannot keep time, how will we take power? So I'm, I'm, let, me, let, me, let me summarize here because I know you're all tired. It's a long day. But I want to raise one last thing. You see, dictatorship does not begin in the state. That's where it ends up. It begins in the family. If you have a dictator in the family, do you expect him to be a Democrat when he takes state power? No. In the same way, even our institutions, and forgive me for talking about parliament, but parliament, you're under a mini dictatorship. And I hope Bana Owiti may say something about the office of the speaker in parliament, because I think in the Kenyan parliament, they've attempted to address this issue. To reduce the powers, to make the speaker <clears throat> first among peers, but not the boss. In Uganda, we have a boss speaker with powerful resources. And that boss speaker, I'm afraid to say, and I'm saying this openly, even before, even with, even with my dear sister, Rebecca, same problem. Immense resources, unaccountable power. And with unaccountable power, you get abuse. And now we're seeing this growing and growing. So even with the speaker's office, maybe we should introduce term limits. Maybe we should introduce term limits. Maybe we should divorce the speaker from being a party member, maybe we should be looking at that issue. Lastly, on the question of the judiciary. You know, I believe, having been a teacher who has produced many, many law graduates, we have the technical capacity. Our lawyers are amongst the best trained in the world to provide the work, the, 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 the human personnel for our judiciary. So our judiciary is very competent. But ask yourself two questions. Number one, why is there a judicial backlog? Even after parliament passed the Administration of Judiciary Act, number one. Number two, for me, the most critical ingredient of a good judge is not that that judge is well trained it is that that judge is brave it is is the word braveness where english prof courageous thank you very much it is that those judges are courageous it's not that they're competent because they have the competence they have llb llm some of them have doctorates, but are they brave enough to make the decisions like the BBI decision, for example, in Kenya? Like some of the other decisions which the Kenyan judges have made. Those judges don't have any more qualifications than our judges, but they have that quality. That quality of courage. And without that quality, however much we talk, however much we talk, even after President Museveni is gone and we get President Akena, we've gone from yellow judges to red judges, whatever the case may be. If they're not brave enough, not so much to address questions of the opposition, but questions which involve the challenge to power. And that for me is the key question. So I end by saying, I end by saying this process of constitutional reform. What we can take from Kenya is number one, we must be vigilant. 
we must be vigilant. If we are saying that these are our constitutional rights, then we must fight for them. It's the last drop. Because we don't want to reproduce a situation where the noobs of this world, who are now outside in opposition, when they take power, they do to us what the NRA, NRM have done. And to do, to be vigilant, we must be vigilant on all fronts. Without that vigilance, I'm afraid, Madam Chairperson, constitutional reform will never help us. Thank you very much.